the artists working in land doing earthworks in the 1960s and 70s came to the American West because it was wide open space available that was cheap or free. And in those days, it was possible to, well, my, possible for Michael Heiser to purchase part of uh, Mormon Mesa above the Virgin River. Um, a gentleman named Guido Darrow helped him purchase that property. Uh, and it was, a, it was a deal worked out where the, the gallery, Virginia Duan Gallery, actually bought the land uh, and let Michael use it. And there was land available, and it was, like I say, it was affordable. Even that land now, even those kinds of, of what we used to think of as remote desert lands are now much more expensive because people develop them. Um, it's astonishing, but you can go by, drive on the highway that, that uh, is the road that you take to get to the town nearest to Michael Heiser, Heiko, Nevada, and, um, and there are housing developments being built out there. It's amazing. So the land, the land was cheap, and the land that Michael Heiser is working on now in Garden Valley in south central Nevada is also land that he purchased. He was able to buy us, basically rangeland for cattle, very poor rangeland, not much moisture, not much forage, so it was inexpensive land. Um, some lands are leased uh, or were leased, long-term leases. Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty Project is on, um, on public land that's leased. And those leases were fairly fairly cheap. So one issue was the cost of the land. And the cost of the land not just as a site for something to happen, but as actual material. So you could move dirt around them. The land was the material. So it was both, both inexpensive as a place to be and inexpensive material to use to make projects. And a couple of different things changed, one of which is, as I say, this land is getting more expensive around the American West, even in the desert, because people are moving out into the desert, just as they're moving up into the Alps in Switzerland, even though they live in the city, they move up, move up, and out. The other thing that's happened, of course, is the regulatory environment has changed dramatically. Um, you know, you used to be able to go to the Bureau of Land Management, uh, which is uh, a federal agency in the United States that owns about 85%, I think, of Nevada or more. Uh, Nevada is a, is, a, is a fairly open place, doesn't have a lot of fences because most of the land is owned by the federal government and leased to people who have cattle or sheep or whatever on the land. Um, the Burning Man Project takes place on land that belongs to the Bureau of Land Management and they lease it from them on an annual basis and that's the only place big enough they could hold that. This is different from, from states such as, say, Texas or New Mexico, where the land is almost all owned by private individuals. So you can't do something unless you buy the land from those individuals if they're willing to sell, and again, it's very expensive. So Nevada was a good site to do these things, but now you have to file um, an environmental impact statement, an EIS. You have to do that whether you're the military planning a military base or you're an artist wanting to do a new project. So um, in the old days, Mm, Heiser could work with Guido Darrow. Darrow would arrange for land to be bought, um, perhaps for water rights to be secured. Um, things were fairly simple. Now, um, in some projects, I mean, if you're Christo or Ugo Rondononi or people who are working on these big land art projects now in the American West, you have to have a legal team. You have to have a law firm, at least one. You have to deal with the BLM uh, permitting process, which is why you need the law firm. Um, you often have to deal with public comments coming back uh, in the environmental impact statement process. Um, so it, it, the preparations go on for years. It's very expensive. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes, um, especially for someone like Christo who is proposing to um, put a tent over part of the Arkansas River in Colorado. A uh, very beautiful project, but a project that has made a lot of people nervous. They have successfully completed, he and his team, the environmental impact statement um, uh, process. So they went through an environmental impact study. And, um, and the, the, the Environmental Protection Agency and its consultants determined that the project would not hurt anything, was not going to kill the fish or whatever. But now you deal with the public that's involved in that process. And the public has been saying, there is only a two-lane road that parallels the river there. If you drive down that road to see the project and there's a lot of traffic, there will be accidents on the highway and the pollution that will be in the valley from the exhaust of the cars will not be good and so forth and so on. So then now, now that they've satisfied a legal, one legal requirement, now they have to satisfy a public requirement. So for land artists now to do these big projects, um, it would either be very difficult to, to buy private land 
to do it on, or it would be very difficult to lease public land to do it on. So. The funding of Earthworks projects, again because it was pretty cheap to do in the early days, wasn't such a big deal. You could have one gallerist, such as Virginia Duan, uh, buying land for a few thousand dollars um, and, uh, and helping to lease a bulldozer that Michael Heiser himself taught himself how to use and then drive um, so he could move, move earth. Nowadays, I mean, Michael Heiser just moved a rock, a really big rock couple of hundred tons um, from a quarry in um, eastern Los Angeles County, San Bernardino County, so it's about say 70-80 miles east of, of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art where this rock came to reside. Um, this project called Levitated Mass and that took millions of dollars because you had to rent an enormous truck, you had to, you couldn't just pick up the boulder and put it on a truck and drive it to Los Angeles. They had to make a truck so part of the cost is because Michael Heiser's ambition got much larger, got very big, or maybe not much larger. He actually had this vision in 1967, 68. But to actually pull this off, you had to, at the scale he wanted, you had to construct a special vehicle that was so large you had to close the roads and you could drive only at night and you had to take down all of the power lines in the way. So again, this would cost millions of dollars. A gallerist, most of them, couldn't afford possibly to do that. Only the largest galleries, maybe a Gagosian or someone could have could afford to do that, but not very many. And as a result, there are nonprofit organizations and private foundations that have stepped in to help make these projects happen. These are organizations that um, were nowhere near as prominent in the 1960s and 1970s as they are now. In essence, the nonprofit, the nonprofit arts organization scene in America now employs more people than the construction industry. That's huge. And it's an enormous part of our economy. So the, the economy in America has basically three parts. You have, um, you have for-profit businesses, you have the government, and then you have the non-profit non or not-for-profit uh, organizations. And those non-profits include almost all of the museums in the United States. Almost all of them are, are, are uh, not-for-profit and they are tax-exempt. And so they have certain financial incentives to be able to raise money and then take that money and turn it around and spend it on a big project. So those partners did not exist at scale like they do now. The other thing that changed was that um, it was really a transfer, an intergenerational transfer of money in families from, from sort of the, pro, the World War II generation down to the next generation. The people such as Patrick Lannan, who uh, his father uh, had a a company that made a lot of money and Patrick Lannan inherited that money and he, his father had been an avid art collector and Patrick Lannan took that money and um, not only collected art but then used it to commission large projects. Funneled the money through the Dia Art Foundation, another nonprofit in New York City um, that already had um, a couple of projects by Walter De Maria. So the James Trell's Road and Crater Project, Michael Heiser's City Project, um, are funded through the Dia Art Foundation uh, by Patrick Lennon and other people, other, other donors and, and other nonprofits. So uh, another thing, of course, that's changed a little bit, and this, this was more important in the early days than it is now, is there was public government money from the National Endowment for the Arts to go towards projects. But these projects are so big that public money, it's not even worth applying for the money. The money is so small compared to the need, so that doesn't count so much anymore. There's also a, um, a class of private collectors who um, include movie stars and business people. Uh, they include people like Glenn Schaefer, who um, was the chief financial officer for a big hotel in Las Vegas, who um, has a large property in New Zealand and, and uh, commissions artworks. There's a series of, of these individuals who commission people such as James Terrell to make the sort of the sky rooms that he makes, right? Uh, the sky windows. Um, and that's, a, that's a whole nother thing. I mean, the, the, um, the idea that you can own your own piece of property and have an artist come in and sculpt it, it's a very old idea. It's a, not so different from 
the Italians or the English or the French sculpting the grounds around a palace or the grounds on your estate um, to you know, hire Capability Brown to come in and, and sculpt your estate and make a certain kind of landscape and put certain kinds of devices in it so the landscape would look a certain way. So I'm not sure that that's really a new thing uh, in terms of the human impulse, but I think it's a new thing in terms of you're finding these collectors asking land artists to do that. So not landscape architects, but land artists. And there's a wonderful, and that brings up another point. You find a lot of architects now who would very much like to be artists, and you find a lot of artists who would very much like to be landscape architects or architects. And you find them crossing these boundaries and committing projects in each other's territory which I think is, again, that's a marvelous thing. That's, it goes back to what I was talking about in terms of the confusion of definitions of terms. It's good to have these boundaries be gray and have people crossing them and wandering through them. Um, so you find someone like Maya Lin, who is a, as an architect, who is very much working as a sculptor and an installation artist and a lot of other kinds of artists. So she's, she's doing these different kinds of projects that you really wouldn't call landscape architecture. You'd call something else. Um, and then you find you find um, you find artists like Robert Irwin doing a, a, a Getty garden in Los Angeles, and that's really the job of a landscape architect. So you find you find people crossing these things back and forth, and I think that's very interesting. Sometimes it's problematic. Sometimes the artists don't understand the physical requirements that a landscape architect would have been trained in, so they make projects that fail. They physically fail. They fall down, or they fill in, or they do something because. They didn't understand how land actually works. And sometimes you find the landscape architects or architects not really succeeding in, in, in making an artwork because they don't understand that sometimes art is a very, very indirect way of looking at something. It's not a direct solution to a problem in a way that a piece of architecture might be. But nonetheless, there's a lot of crossover, and it's very productive, I think, for the field. The question has, has sometimes arisen about the relationship between the artist and the land that they actually use to make projects on. And sometimes you wonder, well, does the artist simply want to own a piece of land and then do something there and it becomes very close to them and they, of course they would never leave it. So Michael Heiser lives where he makes his art. He lives <clears throat> in a ranch house uh, next to some alfalfa fields with buffalo on them that he raises to get a tax credit um, next to his sculpture. Um, I'm not so sure it's a question about ownership as, is, as it is a question about artists residing within their work. And so there are people who First of all, some of these projects take many, many years to complete, and it's simply more effective if you live where you're working. Um, if, in Michael's case, you've got <clears throat> a concrete batch plant that you actually build on the property, um, and you're there to run it, you're there to supervise it, supervise it. So it may not be so much in terms of an artist being in love with a certain piece of property and wanting to hang on to it. I mean, Walter didn't De Maria doesn't live or didn't live at the lightning field. He, you know, it's just a place where he made a sculpture. Um, but some people really want to inhabit the place that they work on. And I, I think that's a very intimate and again, very old human impulse. Um, so I don't think that's, and some people have said, well, America's a young country and what is the, what are the, what are the dynamics of artists working on the land in America when you've got, a, when you've got something that's barely past a frontier historically? Um, are the artists still invested in settling the land in some way and owning something? And, and I'm not so sure that that's true. I think it may be something else that's at work there. There are artists who work um, on land projects who buy property in order to go back to the land uh, or to fix something, to reclaim something. 
there are um, a number, and this is more common than people doing land art projects as, as individual artists doing a, a sculpture or an installation. There are numerous young artists in particular, couples in particular, who buy land, go live on the land, and sponsor artists' residencies on that property for people to come make a project on the property. So there are there are those there are those properties in California, Oregon, Washington, New Mexico, a number of states um, where people have set up these residency opportunities. Um, Wyoming. Um, sometimes they are they are families that have farmed for a long time and they 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 didn't want to lose the farm even though they may have scaled back or stopped farming and so they turn these properties into residencies for artists. Or sometimes they are simply people artists. Um, who go out and buy property and say, we want a small cabin there, um, maybe we'll go spend some time there, but mainly it's for other people to stay there and to do projects. So they will start a nonprofit organization, they will make these residencies, and you're finding this very strong um, sort of career uh, movement where you go and you get uh, a master's of fine arts degree, an MFA at the University of New Mexico, say, and you've gone through a land arts program and you want to continue to work on these kinds of projects and you want to you want to travel and you want to camp and you want to be in the land and so what you do is you start looking for these residency opportunities and so you apply to everything from the national park system which has residencies in the summers and you can be a painter and go to alaska and sit in the national park or you apply to the u cross foundation in wyoming and you actually go sit on a ranch property and work um, the Playa Residency Program, which is on the Southern Oregon, Northern California um, regional border. Um, there are all these different places where people will go and actually do things on the land. And again, those properties are often bought by people who wish to see the land used in a certain way. Um, they might say, this was once a farm, we're not going to farm anymore, or this was a mine, we're not going to mine anymore, but we want artists to use the property instead. The land arts that were created in the American West in the 19, late 60s and 70s in particular were projects that were started then that are still ongoing, such as Road and Crater and City by Heiser. Um, those projects are meant to be, meant to have a long life. They're meant to have a long arc in history. Whether or not they succeed um, depends on a lot of environmental factors, but that's, that is the intent of the artist, They're to last a long time. And those projects, therefore, have to be held within a certain kind of financial um, and political structure. So they're, they, when the artists pass away, will be administered by a nonprofit organization or a museum, such as the Dia Art Foundation uh, or the Los Angeles uh, County Museum of Art or whatever. Because of the expense of making those projects and because of the environmental regulatory restrictions and so forth, and also because of the inclination of younger artists now, you don't see very many big permanent projects being done. You see, I mean, even someone like Krista who makes sort of, I mean, very large, obviously very large projects, they are transitory. They're meant to last for a certain duration of time and then they're taken down. Um, that is a project for which it is easier to get permits from the Bureau of Land Management or any other government agency. Um, it also is more in line with current environmental thinking. So, and it also speaks to the economics of the art world. It's really expensive to transport big sculpture, as I was talking about Michael Heiser's rock, right? It's really expensive to translate, transport things from place to place. It's much cheaper to go to a place and make something in place, and then take it away when you're done. So that becomes a kind of economy of, if you will, of scale that a lot of artists take advantage of. Go somewhere, you make an invention in the landscape, and then you take it down, you're done. Now, there's another train of thought that's been expressed um, in, the, in the mythologizing of land art, and that's that Robert Smithson and Michael Heiser and so forth wanted to escape the gallery slash museum um, economic web. They wanted to get away from the control 
um, that the that was being exercised by museums through their budgets, if you will. You could only make a work so big. The work had to do this, and you had to be organized in a certain way to do these things. Um, you know, there may be some of that. Smithson wrote about that. He said, you know, we're trying to get out of the, out of the system. Um, this is, after all, the 1960s, right? So let's get out of the system, drop out. Okay. I think that's kind of a philosophical add-on, if you will. Um, I don't think that was the primary impulse. I think the primary impulse was let's go somewhere and make something cool that we can do with a lot of freedom that's cheap and that someone hasn't done before. And I think that's a much more basic instinct than we're going to step out of the gallery museum system. However, that being said, there was this anti-commodification movement in the 1960s. It's still going on today, that struggle between um, you know, the art world and the big art fairs and the hundred million dollar purchase prices for art. Um, that's being resisted by a lot of artists. And some artists who do land projects, I mean, I would talk about Andrea Zettel in the Mojave Desert, for example. That is someone who um, is, who needs, I think, not knowing her personally, but from what I've read and heard from people who know her, she needs a lot of personal space to make her work in. She needs some quiet. The Mojave Desert was a place to get, it was still close to Los Angeles. You could still get materials. It wasn't that hard to get to. But it was far enough away that people were not going to drop in on you every 30 minutes. And you could actually get some work done. Not so easy, perhaps, for her now because she's well known and people are trying to drop in on her all the time. And I, now, actually, ironically, the gallery system acts as the protector of her personal space. Um, so I think, again, I think it's a very complicated situation. You know, you allow your art to be commodified through a gallery, but that buys you the privilege of time and privacy to make the art. And so it's a very interesting bargain that people have to have to seek. So this whole idea that um, that artists would would attempt to escape the commodification system comes under immediate suspicion when you realize that there is a gallerist paying for double negative um, and who is owning the land upon which that work sits. And then she, she gives that land and, and the, the sculpture on it to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. There is no escaping that system. So um, sometimes land artists can be grumpy about the fact they are not as famous as they would like to be, especially Michael Heiser. I mean, here's someone who's ferocious about his privacy, and simply he doesn't want people around what he's doing because it's dangerous and there's an insurance hazard and so forth, but mostly he simply wants his privacy. Um, you know, you can't have it both ways. I mean, if you want that privacy, you know, you're not going to be as famous, perhaps, as you want to be. You're not going to be on the cover of art magazines all the time. So, it's, again, it's a complicated dance, I think, between privacy, the financial ability to get things done, the resistance to commodification, the exotic, the, you're being made exotic by the culture by virtue of the fact you're out somewhere remote and distant and you won't see anybody. So it's a... Um, it's a complicated situation, although I think what underlies it are some very simple motives. Let's go somewhere where it's cheap and make something cool that no one's done before. When I talk about artists, especially in the 60s and 70s, going out into the desert um, and doing something cool, it's not to make trivial what they did. There are serious ideas at play there, and Michael Heiser, basically, for example, um, is trying to invent a new sculptural vocabulary. And that's a very serious endeavor, um, and it's not easy, and it's, in his case, incredibly physically demanding. So it's not, it's not, these are not things to be taken lightly. I mean, earth, making earth projects can be physically dangerous. Um, it's amazing. Everybody who's ever seen Double Negative, we're all amazed that uh, when Michael carved that with a piece of earth moving equipment, we're amazed it didn't fall down on his head and, and bury him, you know. So that was in, you know, early days, late 60s. So. It's not to make that trivial, but again, I just want to underscore, I think that sometimes um, the people who write about these projects get tied up in some very, um, get, get, try, get tied up trying to express some, some deep troubles in our society that have to do with the role, let's say, of, of money and art, which is related to larger issues of discretionary income and surplus revenue in entire cultures. Um, they, try to, they try to link that to the motives of the artists, and there may be some of that, but I don't, the, 
The motive of an artist is to be an artist. It's not to make an economic statement. It's to be an artist. There's another wrinkle in, in the story of big land arts pieces being owned by big institutions. So for example, Double Negative, um, which is made in 1969, um, displaces you know, a couple hundred tons of dirt, um, has very steep sides. It is in a pluvial environment. It's in the desert that is, that is shaped by rain, literally, a great irony of the desert. And uh, that piece is now owned by the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. And Heiser has said, gee, I'd like to get that piece back because it's crumbling and I'd like to fix it. I'd like to tidy up those edges again, make them straight. And I would shoot them with, with concrete. And so I would stabilize those surfaces so they would not erode, at least not erode as quickly. And the uh, mocha... Uh, will have nothing to do with that. Absolutely not. They have no, int have no interest in selling the piece, first of all, and they have no interest really in the artist going in to rehabilitate it. Uh, there's a long-standing museum practice that says when a piece of art, let's say a painting um, by a living painter, is damaged in a, in a museum gallery, you don't call up the artist to come fix the painting. Ironically, you call up a restorer, someone else, who has no vested interest in how the painting looks other than to repair it to as close as possible to its original state. The reason for that is you're scared the artist will come in and try to make the painting better, so it won't be the same painting that you bought and you put on the wall in the first place. So it goes from being an artifact from 1964 to being an artifact from 2013. So, um, yeah, museums, museums are basically like, no, you can't come back in here and tidy up and fix this up. You made a gesture, it was meant to live in the desert, it is living in the desert, and as a result, nature is taking its course. Of course, the biggest, the biggest issue that, uh, that comes up in this arena is Spiral Jetty, which is in the Great Salt Lake, and the level of the lake rises up and down, so it has exposed, um, exposed the sculpture when he, built, when he built it for many years thereafter, and then the lake level rose, and it was underwater, and then the lake level dipped again, now those nice black rocks are all covered with salt, so the appearance of the work has changed. Should the Dia Art Foundation go in with toothbrushes and scrub it all clean, and should they actually build a bed underneath the spiral jetty and raise the rocks? And it, I think almost everyone agrees that's a really bad idea. By the way, another thing that's changing the Great Salt Lake, these, uh, that's a terminal lake, uh, although sometimes called a terminus desert lake, uh, which means it has water that comes in and no outlet. So all of the silts that are brought in by the runoff from the mountains that go into that lake mean that the bed of the lake is getting higher. That means that not only is the sculpture being covered by water, but eventually it's just going to be covered by mud. It will be underneath the bed of the lake, which is slowly rising over time. That's the process of the world. You know, um, there's this, there's this uh, very famous article, it was in Art in America years ago, that basically propose that more than 90% of all art that's ever created disappears within 100 years of its own making. And that's sometimes seen as tragic because we've lost entire centuries of things like Greek sculpture or Dutch painting or whatever through war, fire, earthquake, divorce, whatever the cause is. Or just, you know, artworks disappear. They go away. They get thrown away. And they simply melt. Um, there's no reason why earthworks would be any different. Just because they're much bigger, there's no reason that they are necessarily going to be permanent. So if something could last for a long time. Road and crater that Terrell is making, I mean, that feature, that landscape feature, will last for a very long time. And presumably, the way he's building that project, it too will last for a long time. But it won't last forever. So, yeah, so there's this, this irony of a museum ends up owning an earthworks sculpture in order to make it available to the public, but by the same token, because it's no longer owned by the artist who might go in and fix it, it means that earthwork, the earthwork, the artwork, is going to disappear. It's interesting. I don't know what the nature of the legal agreement is between Michael Heiser and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles regarding what rights he has to the piece. Um, 
I believe it's pretty much out of his control. I don't think that, that he has much to do with it anymore. Um, City, and uh, certainly the lightning field, um, and maybe to some extent Road and Crater, the artists there basically did not want people to take pictures of the artworks. And there were two reasons for that. One of which is, if you keep control over the images, you can derive revenue from them, and that revenue can go back into funding the piece. So, um, but there is a more philosophical and perhaps deeper reason, and this is one of those really serious things. It's not just a practical matter, but a genuine aesthetic stance that is taken by these artists. And that is, you can't experience this piece of art by looking at a picture of it. You have to be there. You have to be inside city. You have to be amongst the lightning, the poles on the lightning field. You just have no idea what the piece is by looking at, looking at a photograph. So there are very few photographs of the lightning field. They were basically taken by one guy commissioned by Walter D. Maria, um, who made this amazing set of photographs. He actually got his, his truck was actually struck by lightning one afternoon when he was making some of those beautiful iconic images. Um, he lived, the truck died. Um, but they, they really have kept close control over those images. That is not true for Double Negative. It's owned by MoCA, and anybody can go there and take a picture of it. So I, think, I don't think Michael has much control over that anymore. I think there is um, a notion that is sometimes expressed that the, the early earthworks artists really never intended for people to see their, their works, or not for very many people to see their works. They really intended them just to be constructed, maybe to be photographed up here in an art magazine, and that was it. I don't know if that was true for Robert Smithson. I know it's not true for Michael Heiser. Um, I know it's not true for James Terrell. I, I think the only pieces that artists make where they don't expect someone to come visit and see it are ephemeral gestures. So Richard Long does not expect anyone to go visit a line that he made in the Sahara Desert by walking back and forth. Um, he expects that line to disappear. He created a trace of that project. I mean, the artwork, again, is the walk itself. It's not even the mark he makes necessarily, but it does create a mark, and then he photographs that mark, so it's a trace of a trace. And that's how he expects that work to be, to be experienced. So if you're making ephemeral works, yeah, you might not expect someone's going to come see it in person. Um, and it's only going to be represented in the culture, you know, ever after as in photographs. But the big projects, the big permanent projects, are being set up deliberately to be visited. I mean, they are creating guest houses. So if you go to see the lightning field, there is a guest house that holds six people, roughly, at a time. You're escorted on the property by uh, the manager um, in his pickup truck. He, take, he drives you to the cabin. Um, he, his wife has prepared enchiladas for you for dinner. They're in the refrigerator. There are instructions about how to conduct yourself while you're there. You're free to wander at will, but then he comes back the next day and he collects you and takes you away. That is a model of behavior um, that to some extent will govern how uh, Road and Crater is visited and will govern how City Project by Heiser is visited. So it's, it's a small, you take the people in, you show them the property, there's some kind of explanation. You set out what you hope that people will experience or something of what they will think, and then you're escorted out again. The Museum of Contemporary Art has had a long relationship with Michael Heiser. Um, they were until Michael Govan came from the Dia Art Foundation and came to be the director at LACMA. Uh, MOCA was the, you know, was the West Coast Museum for, for Michael's work. Um, and they had given him a very important show. Um, and so when Double Negative, when that land transfer became possible, uh, Virginia Duan was shutting down basically the gallery and so forth, uh, it was natural for them to, for them to buy it. Um, I don't know what the impulse was at the museum. You could go back and ask Richard Koshalik. Um, but it was something neat to have in a collection, to actually own an earthwork, to own one of the progenitive piece maybe, if you will, of the entire movement. Um, that was a smart thing for a museum to do for a variety of, of reasons. 
Um, they've never, I mean, they don't have someone who sits out there and takes care of it. Um, they don't, they do have, they've had tours, but they basically don't do much to get people out there other than to provide instructions online. Before the internet, you couldn't even do that. I mean, if you went to visit a curator or you wrote one of the curators, you could get a note that said, here's how you go find it. But they weren't really in the, in the position of running a tourist operation out to see the, out to see the, the project. It's not like having it in a gallery and you have docents and so forth to guide you through the work. It was a very different kind of experience. So I think they wanted to own it just to make sure that it didn't fall into somebody else's hands and it got bulldozed and destroyed. The current generation of young artists who tend to work on the land come from a very different place from the artists who arose in the 1960s. Um, this younger generation of artists is trained not just in painting and photography but permaculture. They have a profound, in some cases, a profound ecological awareness and they actually understand um, the science, the mechanisms of ecology. Um, they certainly understand what feedback feedback mechanisms are on the face of the planet. So if you do something and it creates a reaction that can become a self-evolving, uh, worsening situation or a situation that's getting better. So given, the, given simply the cultural background that they have and the fact that there are now art programs, art training programs at the university level that provide tools to their graduate students, undergrads, but particularly graduate students, in land use practices. Um, the fact that there have been a number of artists who have been very, very important to the environmental movement in the United States, whether those are photographers um, such as Ansel Adams or, uh, if you will, his, his counterpart Robert Adams, so one showing the world without humans, one showing the world very much with the effects of anthropic effects on landscape. Um, all of that is now apparent and that's in the vocabulary of artists who are, who are going out into the field and work. I'll give you an example of, of um, of a land artist. I mean, I talked earlier about Helen Newton Henry Harrison inventing basically eco art in the University of California, San Diego in the 1970s. Someone who studied with them um, is Daniel McCormick, who is this artist who, with his partner Mary O'Brien, lives in Marin County. And they do reclamation site specific or place specific um, sculptures. So they will actually go to be brought in to look at a stream bank that's eroding, let's say and they will measure that stream bank and they will create a woven sculpture out of local materials, let's say um, willow uh, branches. And they will make a very handsome sculpture that they, they then place, um, they embed in that stream bank. And what that sculpture does immediately is start to trap silt, it slows the erosion of the bank, but then they live stake those sculptures so that they put um, shoots in to hold the sculpture in place that will then start to grow. And sometimes the materials themselves that they've woven into the sculpture will actually start to grow. So after two years, sculpture is very hard to see, but there's a healthy stream bank. So you actually find these very, I mean, that's a, it sounds like a simple gesture, but it's actually a very sophisticated response to a need for reclamation, um, at least in human terms, of a piece of landscape. And that's an artistic response to it. And more and more you see artists um, willing to engage in that kind of practice. Yes, there's a, a concern with um, form and void, um, but they are very much they are very much working in that in that, what Rosalind Cross you know defined as the expanded field of sculpture. So um, you know she defined that in that essay in the 1970s as being it wasn't just anymore. It wasn't an object that was a sculpture and then something that was um, a void. So you didn't have object and space. You had object and not object. And then she said, well, yeah, but what you basically have is landscape, not landscape, architecture, not architecture. Or it could be architecture and landscape, or not architecture and not landscape, all those different permutations. And that was how you had to define that expanded field. You couldn't just go back and look at Greek sculpture and say that what Daniel McCormick is doing in embedding you know, a woven structure into a stream bank, you I just couldn't say that that came from the same tradition. It just, it, there was that rupture at the end of modernism, if you will, as she defined it. So, the beginning of the postmodern. So, um, yeah, you find now a very different impulse going into the field, but that impulse 
And the very vocabulary that those younger artists are now using comes from Michael Heiser and Robert Smithson and the Harrisons and all of these people working there, and from Joseph Boys and other people.